Hello and welcome to another edition of Sun Dragon Tips and Tricks. I'm Rebecca. I'm the owner of Sun Dragon Art and Fiber in downtown Brevard, North Carolina. And it's Monday, so it's Tips and Tricks Day from my house. I made a video last week about gauge, and a few of you wanted to hear more about magic math. This thing I referenced, this joke we have in the shop of something we call magic math if you can't get your gauge to work. Now this more applies to a sweater. I have a caveat on it though that applies to if say we have a sock knit along going on where there's only one sock size. And so it's a little different. It's, it's maybe you have gauge or you're not as worried about gauge, but you want to try to make a different size sock. So all of these involve a little bit of math. Um, none is perfect, none is absolutely guaranteed, but it can help you if, say, like let's focus on our first example. If you can't get gauge on a sweater, if your stitches are too big or too small, and no matter how you shift it, it's not working, or you really like the fabric that it's creating, and um, you don't want to change it to get gauge, your stitches will be too tight, your, your yarn will be, instead of finding another yarn, what can you do to try to make this pattern work? Now, some people will just say, oh, just go up a size, just go down a size. That's taking a gamble because you're not sure what's going to happen. Um, this math will make it a little more predictable, not guaranteed. If you try the magic math and your sweater comes out too big or too small, your gauge may have shifted. There are other things that may have impacted how this will work but you will have, be a little closer to picking the right size rather than just saying, I'll go up a size, I'll go down a size. It still may not be enough depending on how different your gauge is. Now, someone asked on my last video, oh, that'll be great because then I can calculate how much yarn I need. This is not necessarily going to help with that. I would always overestimate how much yarn you need. If you're following a different size instruction, say, you were going to make a medium and you're going to have to make an extra large because your stitches are so much smaller. You're going to follow the instructions for an extra large to have it come out the size you want. A good starting point is to get enough yarn for the extra large size. That's the best I can give you with an estimate on how much yardage you will need. This is more about following instructions. And we're going off of gauge stitch count this way, which is going to affect the width of the piece. If you are knitting, say, my best example is a top-down sweater. If you're knitting a top-down sweater, your stitches per inch, which I know an inch is a very small measurement. You may wanna measure over four inches and divide by four to get down to one inch, rather than just measuring an inch. But, <laughs> this will help predict how big it is this way. I'm going to reiterate this when we go to the whiteboards. You may need to switch the instructions you're going to follow for this way, but you may still need to follow the length for the original size you wanted to make for this way because we're, we're kind of abandoning row gauge right now. We're saying we want it to fit this way and then we will figure out this way. All of magic math involves some gambles and some challenges, like for a sweater, following the instructions, say for the medium for this size, but the small for this size, so it comes out proportional. If that sounds like too much to tackle, either take the chance and tackle it and see, or if you, you don't wanna be disappointed with the results, find gauge like keep changing your needle size. I always say the best way to attain gauge is to change, change the size of your needle because that's a fixed thing you have control over. Trying to change your tension is very hard to do. So lots of caveats on this, right? The same thing with the sock pattern, which we will get to later. That is um, a gamble too, and you're going to have to take some risks with that. But if you're willing to engage in that, you could be really happy with the results. This is not a guarantee of perfect results. I think that is always um, a near impossibility in knitting and crocheting. There's going to be fudge and wiggle room in them. 
So let's talk about, when we talk about magic math in the shop, um, I'm gonna lead you through what we do if someone comes in and cannot get gauge and wants to figure out which size to make to have it fit them. This is all going to be on the whiteboard this time. I'm not gonna hold up anything. It's just going to be writing on the whiteboard that we will go through. So let's get to it. All right, so magic math. When your gauge doesn't fit or you want to adapt your sizes. And as I mentioned in the introduction, this may not always work, but it's a really great starting point to um, shift things. So the first example we're going to look at today is when your gauge is incorrect, when you cannot get gauge on a sweater. What do you want to do? And there's a couple of things that you need to figure out. First, you wanna figure out what your stitches per inch are. And we're gonna call that X. We got a little algebra going on here. So if algebra was not your favorite subject in school, just stick with us, this can work. So measure your stitches per inch, so many stitches per inch, that's X. Then you wanna find in your pattern where it talks about the number of stitches that are going to be for the torso or the body. And by that, we're talking about, let me draw a little sweater in here. We're talking about this number right in here. Your sweater may start at the collar or it may start at the bottom. It may have sleeves done separately, but this is the number right in here where we really want to find. Now, if you're doing a pieced sweater that might be, there's a front and a back, so you'll have half of that number. That's a little more magic math than we're gonna talk about today, but you may be able to figure that out or I may be able to answer a question for you. This is the number that is going to determine the biggest part of the sweater that you need to fit correctly. Other things may need to be fudged later on, but this is going to give you a starting point for what size to do and we're gonna call that Y. And I, I marked here, a lot of sweaters are being written right now as top down. So you're looking for a number that talks about the body stitches after sleeve separation. That is often some of the keywords you wanna look for in a pattern. So once you separate the sleeves, it'll say there are so many stitches on each sleeve holder and then you have so many stitches left that you're going to continue knitting for the body. So that is your why. And here's your formula. Y, that bigger number, it'll be a bigger number over X divided by X is the inches your torso is going to come out to be. So you want to take the Y number, the torso number, and you wanna divide it by your stitches per, per inch. That is gonna tell you the circumference, how wide your bust, it's gonna give you your bust measurement for your finished piece. So here we have, this is the information that you find in your pattern where it has the smallest size outside of the parentheses and then the numbers getting bigger in parentheses. These are the body stitches that you see in your pattern. And I have numbered them up above one, two, three, four, five, and six. For the sizes, size one is gonna have 100 stitches left after sleeve separation, size two is gonna have 120 and so on. That's the information we need to use to make our calculations. So my example that I've set up Move this all into the camera frame. My example is that their gauge, the pattern writer, wanted five stitches per inch. That means a size six with the 200 stitches is going to, if we, if we use this formula, 200 divided by five, 
gets us 40 inches. So let's say when you are when you picked a size, you picked size six because you want a bust measurement of 40 inches. Now you've tested your gauge and your gauge is not five, it is four. Your gauge is four stitches per inch. That means your stitches are a lot bigger. If you were going to Continue on and say, I will just make a size six. So what if my gauge is wrong? Your size six, you're gonna end up with a 50 inch bust. You're gonna end up with a bust that is 10 more inches bigger. If you like oversize, that's fantastic. But let's say you wanted that 40 inch bust. That was your goal when you picked this sweater. You don't want it to be huge and oversized. So you need to keep trying. I mean, we can, we can rearrange this formula so you can figure out which size you want to make. That's a little bit of algebra. There's two ways to do it. The easier way, if you don't like rearranging algebraic formulas, is keep putting different numbers in for y and divide by your gauge to see which one gives you the 40 inches. The other way to re rearrange this, you can redistribute all of this. You can take the inches you want your torso to be. So we also could rearrange this by saying, I want the 40 inch torso. And I'm gonna multiply that by four. Which one is that going to be? That's 160 stitches. That is a size four. Now, if your brain was like, I don't understand what happened there, I would just keep taking these numbers and divide by your gauge to see what happens. If we take 180 stitches and divide by four, we're going to get 45 inches for the bust. If we took the next one down, 160, and divide by four, that gives us the 40 that we want. So your gauge being off by one stitch per inch means you need to go down two sizes to have the same, the garment come out hopefully remotely the same size as a size six, as someone who's on gauge. You have to go down two sizes and follow those instructions. Now my caveat is, you wanted to make a size six, you wanted to make the biggest size, and you're going to have to go down two sizes and follow those instructions. But I caution there's two numbers to be aware of depending on the part of the pattern. The length instructions, you still want to be following size six. The original size you wanted to make. Whenever there's width instructions, say, for shaping the shoulders, for shaping the decreases, sometimes with the decreases on the sleeves, you actually want to be following a little bit of the original size. If you followed only size four instructions, you would end up with something that is the right width, but shorter than you want it. So that is the caveat. If that's too much to try to keep track of, keep trying to get gauge. If you can bounce around and be flexible with it and keep track of multiple things, use the magic math. Now let's look at what's happening with the idea of adapting a sock pattern. This is my second example for magic math. It's a little different. Say you are getting gauge, but I'm addressing something that one of our sock knitters brought up. Say a sock pattern has only one size and your feet Usually it means your feet are a lot bigger, but it could go either way. I'm going to take the example of a lot bigger. There's only one size for the pattern, but you really like the patterning in it, or you really like the instructions for it, and your foot's a lot bigger than the average sock size it's being written for. Here are the steps I would recommend you follow. Again, I am not an expert sock knitter. So I am making um, some, some estimations here, based, just based on math, based, right? So swatch for your gauge or make the assumption that your gauge is the same as the sock knitters. With, with teeny tiny 
needles for socks, sometimes that's absolutely fine, but sometimes not. So swatch for your gauge. Let's say, and, and I'm putting here, let, write in what you have. How many stitches per inch? That is something to um, keep track of. And let's call that W if we put it in a formula later on. So that's W. Measure your foot circumference. And when you do this, plan for a little negative ease. You want your socks to be a little bit tight. So measure your foot, maybe take off a half an inch. Or I think um, some sock knitters will say maybe 10%. But that is going to be Z. Whatever you are deciding you want to be around your foot. Oftentimes a calf will be the same when you're following um, a basic sock pattern. You need to adjust that if you know you want to make really high socks where your calf is very different than your foot. Or if you know pieces of your foot are different and it won't fit right, then you start adapting the pattern all over the place. So we've got the stitches per inch and we have the circumference you want your sock to be. Then you're going to calculate how many stitches are needed. And that tends to be, that's just a Z times a W. That gives you your stitch count. You may need to round up or down for a pattern repeat. We'll talk about that in a second with Hermione's Everyday Sock. More math in here because that total number, stitch count, you want to divide by two to have a general sense of the top and bottom of your foot to start adapting the pattern. Because if you just follow the pattern as written, your stitch count, it's going to end up really funky. You have to adapt all of the instructions if you want to make a different size sock. But dividing by two is going to give you a general sense of half and half because top and bottom of the foot for the decreases and also the heel is often done with half of those stitches. So that'll give you a good starting point. We'll take a look at an example of this in just a second. I have two stars here because I don't have a magic formula for figuring out where you want to do your heel turn your your and your toe width. It usually is going a little past the center to start turning your heel or not going all the way into the center if you're doing a short row heel. So that you may have to figure out on your own through some trial and error. So be ready to rip out your toe or your heel as you're figuring this out. I took a basic of Hermione's Everyday Sock for some of these numbers. That one has a cast on of 64 stitches and the gauge is nine stitches per inch. So it's going a little bit backwards from what we have up here. But to figure out the foot that is meant for, I can use the formula from over here from, from your torso. The total stitches divided by the gauge of nine stitches per inch means it's gonna come out about seven inches of circumference for that sock. Now, if your foot was bigger, let's say the circumference we need is something closer to 11 inches. That This is our new Z. So nine times the 11 is gonna give us our new cast on. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at some of that. Nine times 11 equals 99 stitches for our new cast on. However, that is neither even, like it's hard to divide by two, or for Hermione's, we need a multiple of four. So I'm going to, to go down. So Hermione's has a four stitch repeat. So I'm gonna go down to 96. Or I could even, if I wanted a little more negative ease in that, I wanted it to really stick on my foot. And I'm gonna go down to say 92. Let's say we pick 92. So 92 is our new cast on. That means, again, Hermione is written for, is written for two circulars. So we're gonna divide that in two. 
that means we're going to have 46 stitches on each needle. So 46 stitches is going to be how many stitches are used for the heel. And when I need to do a heel turn, I'm going to need, so like a heel, often there's about five stitches in the center. If we think about a heel doing this, you're going to go, when you start turning the heel, you're either going to go to the center and then maybe five stitches over to start your, do it going, your back and forth for the heel. I have another video on a general setup for a heel. Or if you're doing a short row heel where you're, you're going in towards the center, but you're stopping before and knitting across, you want to stop about three or four stitches before the center. You want maybe five stitches in the center here. If that helps you start to set up what's going to happen with your heel. I'm actually not going to try to draw that out but you want to have a barrier. You don't just want to go to the center for either a, a, a heel turn or a short row. You need to add in a buffer so that your heel is not too pointy. And the same thing for your toes, you need to just decide if you are either starting here and going out or this is toe up. Or if you are decreasing and ending. You need to decide how pointy you want your toe to be because you're changing numbers. You're using basic ideas but changing numbers for your pattern. So there's a little more work to engage in when you modify a sock pattern. So thanks for joining us today to talk about a little bit of magic math when it comes to sweater and sock patterns. This can be used for other things as well, but those are the things I use it for most. And I really use it for sweaters. I try to adapt it for socks in case you want to start something like the Hermione's Everyday Sock, but that one size it's written for will not work for you. You have some information to engage in and to see if that will help you adapt the pattern. If that was all way too complicated, I can help as best I can if you have questions, but it could just be, it's more important to get gauge and work it that way. Then there's less to think about. It really depends on if you like engaging and thinking about these numbers, or if you wanna make it as simple as possible, get gauge, follow the pattern. Nuff said. So uh, if you've enjoyed watching this, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. You can always jump over to the Sun Dragon Sideshow to see what Liz and I are working on. She will not be working on socks, but she is doing other fun things. Now she likes, when she does her ranunculi and things like that, she likes just saying, well, if the gauge doesn't work, it's going to be fun. She likes going bigger and just making assumptions. She also has used magic math quite often if she finds a pattern written for teeny tiny needles and she doesn't like teeny tiny needles. So she will adapt it for a completely different weight of yarn. And for the most part, I think it's worked. <laughs> Back to please consider subscribing. If you'd like to support the work that we do, uh, you can always go over to patreon.com slash sundragon for a monthly fee to support us. Or you can become a member here. That's also a way to support the work we do. And we also have super thanks, which is kind of like giving us a little tip. <laughs> but anything you can do just that you watch this video is wonderful. If you'd like to give us a thumbs up, again, subscribing, writing a comment, none of that has any financial obligations to it. Uh, we, we really like to support people as much as we can in their crafting. And as I always like to say, may your crafting be filled with joy and confidence. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Did you take my seat? Yes, you did. I know. It's comfortable.
I'll just sit next to you and edit my video.